He has reigned for 10 years and at age 14 has become the longest reigning monarch of his dynasty. He has witnessed life, loss, monumental moments and catastrophe. Through it all, these things have been constant, love and devotion. This is the story of the life of a king, a brave and noble warrior for mental and emotional wellness, a devoted son, father and grandfather. He is the bridge between the past and the future, the epitome of love, dedication and virtue. He is our king, Valdemar. Valdemar Caitlin Catsford, in most regards, resembles your average cat. He awakes every morning to breakfast served on the schedule. He gets in his exercise, spends time with his family, then goes back to sleep. At least, that is, until lunchtime. But there is something unique about this portly feline. You see, he isn't quite as average as appearances may suggest. Especially when you see him like this. In case the images haven't given it away by now, this is no ordinary neighborhood fat cat. This is His Majesty, King Valdemar, Emperor of Corquet, Custodian of Catsfordia, Steward of Catlandia. But you may call him Your Majesty. At age 14, he is the longest living and longest reigning monarch of his dynasty, having inherited the throne of Colquitt from his mother, Queen Elaria, who inherited from her father, King Marin, who inher- uh, Well, folks, this is where it gets a little complicated, uh, so we will do our best to explain a brief history of the Catsford dynasty. It all began when the Ratsifir dynasty died out, leaving the throne vacant. Without a direct heir, and so many rival cousins with wealth and power behind their claims, civil war seemed inevitable. So the Royal Council decided to offer the crown to the commander of the Imperial Military, General Catheringham Catsford. Who better than the one leader who had the loyalty of the entire military? The plan seemed flawless. That is, of course, until he turned them down. Instead, he offered his own candidate, his youngest daughter, Caitlin. Young, ambitious, and by far the most intelligent contender at the table. Who could say no? But for the Royal Council, there was one problem. Why would these rival Ratsifir claimants be afraid of a mere girl? Well, that's where Daddy comes back into play. General Catteringham offered full military support for his daughter's claim. And thus begins the Catsford Dynasty. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Queen Caitlin I was democratically minded and progressive. She didn't care much for the trappings of monarchy and certainly wasn't a family gal. She never had interest in marriage nor children. So when she died unexpectedly in a fire, Corquet was once again left with a succession crisis. Enter Caitlin II. The younger sister of the late queen put herself forward as heir to the throne. This time her brother was head of the military, and like his father before him, offered his full support. Caitlin II was just as democratically minded as her sister had been, but often behaved more like a dictator. She stood up to the Rassifia cousins, that's for sure, and put them in their place. She reigned as one of the most popular monarchs ever. That is, until she was assassinated. After a few years without a sovereign, in which a Grand Duke reigned, an heir was found, the son of the late Queen's second cousin. His name was Prince Marin, and his reign as King is where things begin to take on all the sparkle we enjoy today. It's also the most juicy part of the whole story, 
Marin having children with his mistress instead of his wife, then that mistress becoming the empress of the neighboring kingdom and starting her own dynasty. But we're not here to discuss all that. Let's move on to Marin's daughter. But said mistress, the exquisitely beautiful duchess turned empress Alexandra von Katzcliffe. <clears throat> Their child's name was Alaria, and she succeeded her father in every aspect. Young, beautiful, charismatic, and glamorous! In addition to being one of the Corkwood's most successful and beloved monarchs, she possessed movie star good looks and amassed one of the largest personal jewel collections in the entire world. All of it was passed on to her son, and the subject of this documentary, His Majesty. Your Majesty, are you ready for your photo shoot? In 2018, image is everything, especially if you're royal. The most assured way to create an impact is to have a dynamic social media presence. And the Catsfoots clearly have that under control. In recent years, His Majesty has lessened his involvement, preferring to leave it to the younger generation. And they have all stepped up in exemplary form. Let's meet the family, shall we? First, there is our social media star, Crown Princess Alonwe. The eldest granddaughter and heir apparent to the king has become something of a phenomenon in the online cat community. Her wedding to the Duke of Katzberg in 2014 left the world of Kitty Couture speechless, not to mention starting the trend of fabulously displaying historic family jewels. Followers and subscribers tune in weekly to see her latest edition of Tiara Tuesday. But viewers don't have to wait until Tuesday to get their royal kitty fix. The family posts a variety of photographs each day. Next, we have the resident bad boy of the family, Prince Soren Foster. His name alludes to when he first came into the royal family as a foster kitten, but it became evident after only a few weeks that this little prince was here to stay, and he officially joined the family in 2014 making him the first ever adopted member of the royal family. He has since become a social media sensation of his own. With his piercing green eyes and perpetual catitude, he is definitely the edgier member of the family, and we love him for it. But Prince Soren wasn't the only addition to the family in 2014. Meet Prince Severus, Duke of Katzberg, and husband of Crown Princess Alonwy. Tall, dark, and incredibly handsome, he is the epitome of the fairy tale prince in every aspect. Gentle and brooding, he is the heartthrob of the family, but he was no stranger to the trappings of royalty before he married the princess. Snape, as he is referred to by the family, was His Majesty's best friend and courtier, and is the hereditary Duke of Catsburg, a title he hopes to someday pass to his descendants. Which brings us to the latest addition to the royal family, Princess Marina Noel. I love Marina. She's the newest member of the family. And um, she's so, so beautiful. And who doesn't love a princess story? Her name refers to the day she became a member of the House of Catsford. Christmas Day of 2017, in case you haven't put two and two together. Keeping in tune with modern times, the daughter of Alonwin and Snape is the second adopted member of the family and the first direct heir to the throne ever, not biologically related to the reigning monarch. But you'd never know it. Marina and her great-grandfather not only look alike, but she possesses many of his characteristics. Kind, compassionate, gentle, sweet-natured, and stubborn beyond reason. She may be named after the king's grandfather, King Marin, but she is King Valdemar made over. And she is already a social media sensation. Just ask Lady Lorne. One more reason why I love Marina the most and why I absolutely adore her is because she's adopted. There's a stigma uh, attached to adoption, or sometimes even fostering, and for the royal family to be so open to change from tradition. I, I just think it's, I think it's beautiful. Of course, with being royal come official duties. 
The royal family have fostered over a dozen fellow felines, dogs, and even birds. And their social media presence is assured to gain attention to whatever important cause they may champion. And then, there are the royal events, the most glamorous of the royal duties. Tonight is the diplomatic reception and banquet for representatives from Valdovia. Fur and Fowl alike come from all over the Empire to attend and represent their provinces. That is, if they can make it past security. It's also a really big evening for Princess Marina. For the first time, she is allowed to attend an evening occasion, for which she gets to wear her first diamond tiara. Like so many of the most spectacular pieces in the royal collection, this one originally belonged to Queen Alaria. She wore it as a necklace. But it has been converted to fit the tiny head of this regal young lady. Now all that remains is... What to wear? Her mother has chosen heirloom rubies while his majesty looks as dashing as ever in his velvet sash. Crystal, silver gilt, and sparkle. Now this is monarchy. And no monarchy would be complete without their royal jewels. Oh my gosh, those royal jewels. Some are as old as the dynasty itself, while others are quite new, and most can be attributed to the magpie of the family, Queen Alaria, who famously had a penchant for movie star glamour. While all members of the royal family are expected at some point to wear these heirlooms, it is Crown Princess Elonwyn who has made it a mission to present the family heritage every chance she gets. Currently on display at the Imperial Museum are some of her namesake's most dazzling diamond works of art. These are the personal jewels that Queen Alaria collected during her reign and have been passed down to her great-granddaughter. But even these sparklers pale in comparison to the much older and much bigger crown jewels. The crown jewels are the personal possession of the monarch, and the most important of these gilded treasures is the imperial crown. Made for King Marin for the occasion of his coronation, this incredible piece helped to create a new image for the monarchy one of power and prestige, and of course, pomp and ceremony. His Majesty wears the crown in one of several adjustable configurations as often as possible, carrying on the tradition started by his grandfather, King Marin, to wear a crown to every meeting of the royal council and royal court. It is a way of solidifying royal authority and presenting the ultimate image of regal power. In every family, there is loss. The royals are no different from anyone else in that regard. But the exception is that they must endure their grief publicly. Some say it helps us relate to them more, while others believe that they should be allowed to grieve in peace. This was Queen Antonia's view when in 2010, she had endured enough with the loss of both her mother-in-law, Queen Alaria, in 2008, and her own daughter, Crown Princess Nerowen, just two years later. Queen Antonia has since retired from public life altogether. 2014 was another difficult year, in which loss played a devastating role in the lives of the royal family. Just after the royal wedding, Crown Princess Elonwyn would lose her pregnancy to cancer, and would have to undergo emergency surgery to save her own life. I actually remember that quite well. I remember how distraught Brandon was, and it was heartbreaking. It's never easy seeing your fur baby in pain. Shortly thereafter, while still in mourning, Prince Severus would lose his beloved brother Moose, Earl of Moose the Giddy. And in 2017, the royal family lost one of its most important members. Lady Nina, a steadfast support for the family since the reign of Queen Ilaria, she had served as Supreme Courtier and as Minister of Acquisitions for the Crown, securing many 
of the important pieces of art and jewelry in the royal collection today. But her most important and coveted role was that of grandmother to her beloved fur babies. Which is why a small statue of a cat stands guard over her grave. A gift from King Valdemar, ever watchful and ever loyal. But for every life they have lost over the years, there are those lives that have been saved by royal intervention. We foster through Orange County Animal Services. Uh, we take in um, kittens that are um, abandoned or homeless, and we love it. Every now and then there is a special kitten, dog, squirrel, or even bird that benefits from being fostered by the royal family until a suitable home can be found. Prince Alastair, Lady Muffin, and even little Dickie Greenleaf have benefited from His Majesty's loving and accepting home. I love fostering. I believe that it saves lives because it just creates room in the shelters. I foster for Hearts Alive Village and in a couple weeks I'm going to be fostering for Homeward Bound. Those are local Las Vegas shelters. So you save a life. Fostering is the way to go. I know I'm rambling. <laughs> There's even room for adoption in the royal family. Prince Sorn and Princess Marina aren't the only chosen family members. Meet Victoria, Duchess of Dogsborough and Countess Cairn. She is part of a very special, noble line of Scottish forebearers who fill the role of courtier to the king. Much like Nala, Duchess of Dogshire before her, she has the vitally important role of protecting the king and members of the royal family, not to mention providing endless amounts of joy and comfort. In 2008, the loss of Queen Alaria not only affected the king and his feline family, but devastated his human. The king and his daughter Nerowen provided unfailing emotional support despite their own grief, a trait that the king has passed on to future generations of the royal family. Which brings us to the most vital role the royal family play, that of comfort animals. It may be difficult to watch, but this is Princess Marina providing immediate comfort to her human, who is suffering a severe anxiety attack. These attacks can cripple a person, and it takes a lot to calm them down. Fortunately, Her Royal Highness has the magic touch. Animals of all kinds can be comfort and support animals, providing their own special kind of therapy to those who need it. Just ask our friends at Dreamcatcher Ranch, or any facility that utilizes animals in their therapy providing abilities. Something King Valdemar performs exceptionally well. And the time they spend together as family is by far the most therapeutic. Here they gather together in order to watch, for the very first time, the moment King Valdemar was crowned. The coronation. The event was spectacular. I'd never seen anything like it before. The jewels, they glistened in the light and it added a sort of supernatural aura to the whole thing, as if the stars were in attendance as well. A medieval ceremony, but relatively new as well. The ritual you see performed here, seemingly ancient, was actually written and choreographed by the king's grandfather, King Maron. That's right, the pomp and ceremony were all part of an elaborate orchestration to portray the monarchy as a brilliant beacon of hope and aspiration, to appear as something their subjects could be proud of and look up to. Today, the sparkle and grandeur of the monarchy continue to inspire a new generation while upholding their mission statement, to bring love and joy through the images and videos we share on social media when physical interactions are not possible with our special brand of comfort.